Welcome to Writer to Writer, a program produced at Florida Community College of Jacksonville. I'm your host, Roxanne Eastwood, and with me today is actor, poet, writer, performer, Ray McNeese. Hi, Ray. So nice to have you join us. It's good to be here. Good. Um, you know, you really have been one of the pioneers of this whole poetry performance movement. In fact, you've said that a poem is, is not finished until it's read out loud. Can you tell us a little bit about, um, about that movement and why it's getting so much attention? Well, uh, the performance poetry movement or spoken word movement, uh, there's a lot of different names uh, being bandied about for it now. I, I prefer to just call it poetry myself. Um, but it has its roots in the oral tradition, and that's kind of where I'm coming from. Um, it combines a lot of different elements of other art forms. There's uh, elements of theater involved in it, uh, stand-up comedy, music, storytelling. Um, you put all those, all those into the mix, and bada boom, you got some performance poetry. Um, I think that uh, people are hungry for um, poetry again, and, and hungry for a very genuine and sincere uh, interaction with uh, with someone and poetry really offers that so that's one of the reasons I think it's enjoyed some popularity um, in the last few years um, but like I said it's a it's a art form that has its roots in a very ancient tradition and I feel that um, a lot of the folks who are out here doing this um, performing now and uh, poetry now are are in that are walking that talk they're walking the talk of endless others who have gone before them so it's I, I don't want to say that there's there's never been anything like us before. I, I mean, um, I think it, it it's came from that, and I think we're just carrying on that tradition. Um, and not to, to slight the literary community at all, because I have my foot in that community as well. Mm -hmm. I kind of straddle both. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, but people, I think, are hungry for that kind of interaction. And a lot of people bemoan the fact that, oh, you know, theater is dying out. I don't think it ever will. I think that there's always going to be um, gatherings of people and people are always going to be have that need to have some kind of visceral interaction with a performer and there's nothing quite like that space mm -hmm. um, that you create when you perform in front of a live audience you're, mm -hmm. as we're doing now you're flying by the mm -hmm. seat of your pants and um, there's a real energy to that that you, you can't get uh, I've done film work too and, and you know I have to do the same line of uh, poetry for instance mm -hmm. 15 times and bring the same emotion to that line time, right which is an art form in itself. Um, but I prefer doing live theater. And um, poetry is the medium by which that I, I communicate my kind of theater. I think sometimes in this high-tech world, that, that communication, um, the live communication, really becomes much more of a need than... than um... People are responding to it. I mean, I, I actually make my living, albeit a very thin definition of making a living as a, as a poet. And I travel all over the United States. I do a lot of work in the southeast here. Um, about 10 months out of the year, I'm on the road. Uh, one year, I did almost 50,000 miles, oh road miles. Um, and a lot of times, it's uh, I mentioned this to you before, it's kind of like the old Chitlin circuit and the, and the blues musicians mm -hmm. used to travel. And it was enough money to, you got enough money get from the from gig place to, place. to get down the road to mm -hmm. the next gig. Um, it's getting a little bit better than that because uh, as, as a group, we're making inroads into academic circles and, mm -hmm. um, and we also have, for instance, myself, I mean, I have a lot of connections in the theater world. Mm -hmm. uh, I've directed plays and I'm an actor as well, so I have that also, that circle. They're, they're all wheels within wheels and <laughs> somewhere out there, um, there's a poet right now doing their poetry. Doing so the you can thing. be sure of that. It's like the old someone's praying, Lord, mm -hmm. uh, someone's doing a poem. It may not be a great poem, but <laughs> thank God someone's doing it. You are on the road a lot, Ray, with your um, page-to-stage productions, and you work so much with young people. Do you draw on some of those experiences for your writing? The, yeah, it was probably inevitable that I would, uh, and almost cliche, that I would write a long poem about the road. <laughs> <laughs> but I did, mm -hmm. and it's called The Road That Carried Me Here, and it's... Uh, <clears throat> It's a, it's a long Whitman-esque kind of jaunt across the country and uh, details a little bit about what that life is like and also the whole idea of the road um, as a metaphor for American life. I think mm -hmm. that's something that one of the strands that weave into this performance poetry is, of course, the beat poets. I think they're our, our, probably our, most, our nearest predecessors um, were the beat 
the beat movement people and uh, and there's in fact there are still there there are still readings uh with the we do with beat poets mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. i did a reading with jim carroll who was kind of one of the the grandchildren of the beat movement and uh so in fact that press that published that book was uh the rant press is uh published ginsburg and corso and all those people so mm -hmm. they're like i said again it's part of that continuous A tradition continuation, right. um and and as those folks have moved into academic circles so have we so right um, when you're on the road and you're doing um, all of this work with kids um, what kind of messages do you give to them uh, for those aspiring writers Blow up your TV. <laughs> um, no, I, I, um, I'm, I'm very glad and blessed to be working with children because I learned so much from them. And uh, I'm basically a big kid myself, and I'm allowed to play mm -hmm. my way through my life. And, and I've been very blessed to be able to do that. Um, so they teach me as much as I teach them mm -hmm. about life. And there's a good, and I guess maybe that's one of the things I'm teaching them is that, that, that life is open and that, there's an, that there is a communication and interaction that they can have with adults and that they're they're part of the community they're part of the community mm -hmm. um, as a whole um, I encourage them to write every day um, even if it's something that they even if it's just something in a journal because mm -hmm. they never know when they're gonna look back on that years hence um, and one thing is that we've as poets we've had a long uh, way to go to convince people that what we're doing is not something that's going to be too intellectual Unfortunately, the way children have been taught poetry for the longest time is that there's a meaning hidden in this poem somewhere, mm -hmm. and it's your job to find it by 8.30 on Wednesday right. morning. <laughs> right. um, that's kind of the cart before the horse approach that I was um, taught poetry, and it, it just killed it for me. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that I'm doing poetry now is not really because of any poetry classes I took in school, maybe in spite of them. Oh, really? Um, yeah, because uh, I, I just did a workshop with teachers, and you know, teachers hate poetry. <laughs> they hate to teach poetry. A lot of them. I shouldn't say all of them, but a lot of them. And I, again, I think it's because they were taught that there's a lot of rules mm -hmm. um, to poetry. And what, what performance poetry does is it takes, it, it kind of blasts all that apart. It doesn't, it doesn't, it works from the inside out, not from the outside in. Right. Um, it's not about the rules coming in. No poet ever wrote a poem so that you could take a quiz on it on Wednesday morning. They didn't write a poem to demonstrate iambic pentameter mm -hmm. or simile or metaphor or anything like that. This is the way we've been taught poetry, and it's kind of killed it. So what we do um, is we come in and we perform poetry. We don't, and, and a lot of times the kids say, I didn't even know that was poetry. Uh -huh. So um, Really brings it alive for and them. And then they start to understand. Of course, there's enough poetry around in their lives right now with rap music and, and the lyrics for any rock and roll song. If it, you know, There's good poetry out there. So they know what's going on mm -hmm. I, I, and I teach it that way too I play guitar so I mm -hmm. I teach that poetry is it's song it's theater it's storytelling mm -hmm. it's all of these things it can be mm -hmm. any number of those different things it's, it's certainly not something that you know you're gonna have to learn the rules of in order to do not that you don't have to have the skills mm -hmm. but I teach it more as a craft um, like you you know to be a good carpenter you have to learn how to use a plane and a mm -hmm. level and a plumb line and things like that you know I mean that's that's kind of the way I approach it not mm -hmm. that there's a lot of intellectual things that you have to know and if you don't have the right training or the right letters after your name then you're not gonna be able to understand this mm -hmm. I think poetry kinda got co-opted by um, academic circles and unfortunately um, it's stagnated under that I really had assumed since you work with children so much that you must have had a mentor or um, someone who inspired you as a child, but that's not so. Um, yeah, I did. I had some good. I had some very good teachers. Um, probably one of one of the teachers. I've just been doing a piece lately called uh, "Sister Margaret Algebra's Purgatory," about my experiences growing up in Catholic school, and, and probably Sister <laughs> Margaret. In, you know, the fact that she ruined me for math is probably one of the reasons <laughs> I'm a poet now. Uh, she used to hover over me with uh, back in the day when they used corporal punishment and uh, right, I remember those days the uh, so I never been able to do math and uh, that might be one of the reasons <laughs> that uh, I'm a poet now but um, probably my biggest influence was uh, my paternal grandmother uh, Zelma Klein uh, I'm related to Patsy Klein I'm proud to say All right. um, she was an Appalachian woman from West Virginia um, was self-educated uh, and till the day she died she memorized poems 
She would recite the whole book of Ruth in the Bible to me. And oh, my goodness. She sang songs and told stories. So for me, it was something very natural. I mean, she was born before MTV, NBC, I mean, <laughs> NOTV. Right. So the way of the form of entertainment that we had was we went to the parlor <laughs> and uh, had some uh, fried chicken and lemonade or iced tea, and, and um, someone would tell a story or sing a song. Mm -hmm. And we sat around the parlor, and, that, and when I visited her in, uh, when I was growing up, and so it was very natural for me, mm -hmm. and I feel very fortunate and lucky that I came out of, there was an extant oral tradition that I came mm -hmm. out of. And, uh, how, how is performance poetry different from storytelling? Um, in my case, I don't think it's much different because uh, I do have that, a lot of my stuff is very narrative. It tells mm -hmm. a story. Um, I think the language may be a little bit more condensed. It may be a little bit more energetic. Uh, it may be a little bit more musical. Um, than, a, than a storytelling. Uh, storytelling, however, has a, a lot of different forms, and some of the mm -hmm. great, J. O. Callahan, a great one of, he's an inspiration for me now, um, great storyteller who, who does a lot of those very things in his mm -hmm. stories. Um, I think uh, it's a little, storytelling t seems to be a little bit more laconic and more prosaic than, than uh, a narrative poem. Mm -hmm. Um, for instance, when the classic narrative poem, the outlook was not brilliant for the Mudville Nine that day. The score <laughs> stood four to two with but one more inning left to play. So you can see how that kind of moves along right. and it builds its own dramatic tension by the rhyme and by the mm -hmm. rhythm of it. Um, and you don't want to get that cloying kind of rhythm that we, that's the other flip side of the, uh, the way we were taught poetry. It was like, I think that I shall never yeah, see, see a poem as lovely as, as a tree. tree. <laughs> I call that the la 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 <laughs> poetry train because you get caught on that and, and uh, it's taught that way and too often that's, that also kills it because what, what that does is it runs right over the meaning of it. Mm -hmm. Shakespeare wrote a lot of his stuff in iambic pentameter but if you got up there and did his sonnets, let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments, it just doesn't sound right. Mm -hmm. Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Mm -hmm. Love is not love that alters where it alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove. It is an ever fixed mark. So it's written in iambic pentameter but you wouldn't know it from that reading of it. Right. And I think all, you know, all good Shakespearean actors understand that and uh, most good poets understand that too. So I don't think it's, I think it's still, I mean, you know, Shakespeare tells a story but he tells it in a poetic form. Well, you've told a little bit of his story. I was wondering if you might share a story with us today. Um, yeah, I, I can, uh, as I mentioned, uh, my uh, paternal uh, grandmother uh, is from Scotland and um, my grandfather is from Ireland. And both of those countries have great traditions of oral uh, storytelling and poetry and song. Mm -hmm. um, so I was very, as I said, I was very lucky to have that to draw from. And, uh, when I started to get in touch with my roots, which I think was a real important step for me to take because we had been divorced from, we kind of came up the Hillbilly Highway, um, mm -hmm. Route 70, uh, 70, um, 70, 71 and Route uh, 75 and Route uh, 72, 71 and 70 up in... They're all running together all, after all, all this time, aren't they? to the factories <laughs> is where they all ran to. And... Uh, my father was very self-conscious about his roots because they called him Arkansas when he was growing up, even though he was from West Virginia. But because he had that twang, they called him Arkansas. So um, it was a big step for me to um, to go back down that hillbilly highway, and not only to go back down that hillbilly highway into the Appalachian chain of mountains, but to realize that that chain of mountains goes all the way up through Maine, down through the Atlantic Ocean, and back up through Northern Ireland mm -hmm. and Scotland, and actually under the North Sea and up into Finland and uh, you can hear fiddle tunes all the way down that thing all the way to Red Mountain and in Birmingham that have <laughs> a lot of similarities. Right. So when you talk about uh, that's a whole migration that, that uh, I think is un unknown to a lot of people as well and so I went back to Northern Ireland to, um, to find out about my roots and to find out about that tradition and I went to the glens of Antrim where my uh, family was from and I uh, got all embroiled in the politics of Northern mm -hmm. Ireland. Um, my father was very proud of his Irish heritage and it was something that he handed down to me. So it came full circle when I went mm -hmm. back to uh, Ireland and I, I wrote this piece about Ulster, which um, the, pro the northernmost province of Ireland, which is still under British occupation rule, however mm -hmm. you want to, depending on your side of the question, however you want to define it. Um, 
but I, I'll do that poem for you. I would love that. That'd be great. Um, Ulster is uh, Ulster has, has been known for centuries as being a pretty bloody place, and uh, the flag of Ulster has a red hand on it. And the legend is is that um, the first uh, guy to come over there from Scotland, he cut his hand off and threw his hand on the shore to lay claim to the land. Uh, whoever set foot on the ground first would would own rights to the land, um, and it, that brings up a really big point because that's the big squabble over there is who owns the land and whose land it is. This is called uh, Remembering a Dismembered Ulster. I'm remembering a dismembered Ulster. The red hand hacked off the sailor's own arm and thrown ashore to lay claim to the land. The severed head of blessed Oliver Plunkett, a shrunken leathery stare, housing mites now, surveying the remains of martyrdom from the sunk of a, from the sunken hulk of a medieval cathedral. The rebels from the glens of Antrim who Cromwell captured and drew and quartered in the name of the one true God. The murals of arms on gray decrepit project walls of arms rising from flames, breaking chains, brandishing guns. The blasted bodies of Brits, Welsh, Scots, Irish, when I went back to my roots, I found them tangled, twisted, sucking the blood brother's feud from the old sod, rising twisted as a blackthorn, a skeleton tattooing the sky with its gory story, beating the lambic drum, beating the boron till the hands bleed again. I was trying to piece together the place I came from, gawking at the locals like they were living fossils, seeing a face shaped like my sister Pat's, the Viking stature of my sister Mickey, the olive-tinted skin, dark hair, and green eyes of my sister Maureen, and my own close-set eyes staring back at me from the carved gray stelae of Clon MacNoise. MacNeese, the professor claimed, a very old Celtic name, descended from Conahur MacNessa, king and traitor. The Mac shortened to Mick by the English, mutilated further by Protestants to M apostrophe to exorcise the ghost of the old tongue. Manis, the stern old orangeman in Larne Townland pronounced it, he was the last of his line in a town where my name fell on both sides of the divine. There's another with the same name down the lane, but you don't want to have anything to do with them. Just the same. Could you tell me where they lived? And eyeing me now with the contempt reserved for those who were lazy, ignorant, stupid thieves. Oh, you'll know who they are. They're the only one on the street, ain't got the red, white, and blue painted on their curb. Catholics, the boy reconfirmed, for as long as any of me uncles can remember. And as he led me to the door, but no further, he called after me in the gathering dusk. We have a saying here in the north, mister. The English can't remember the past, and the Irish can't forget. And I make my way back to America between those two places. Thank you. That was so very nice. That's what happens when you start digging around in the <laughs> in your closet. Room, so. <laughs> um, but th that's the process, too, that I tell the kids is that um, they, they all have these family stories and these anecdotes. Mm -hmm. And uh, just a little detail like that. I mean, that poem is built around that the saying the kid gave me at the very end, which really resonated for me and really made me think not only about Northern Ireland or about Yugoslavia, where the other side of my family is from, but also about the United States where we, we have a similar problem where there's a lot of people that can't forget the past and a lot of people that can't remember it. Mm -hmm. And we seem to be at that, locked in that impasse in the same way that Protestants and Catholics, even who have the same name and look exactly the same, mm -hmm. um, have. And so poetry is a way for me to explore those kind of issues and to bring them out so that they're in the open and that we can communicate about them openly. Mm -hmm. So I encourage the kids to dig deep into what they got going on in their own lives. In and their own families. And 
Mm -hmm. I, I shouldn't say kids, I, everybody, you know. I mean, I think that's what poetry's one of poetry's jobs is. I have a real working class attitude towards poetry. I come mm -hmm. from a working class background, and, I, and, it, and it's, it's a job. I love my job, I really do. And uh, I really see that it's, it's, it's something that comes out of my own experiences, and that those experiences are valid. Those working class values and mm -hmm. experiences are valid. Um, I'm college educated. I, you know, I went through that whole rigmarole, which was fine, good, beautiful, mm -hmm. love it. But um, I'm, I'm never going to forget where I came from. Mm -hmm. Ray, um, before we go today, I know that you have been a member of two National Poetry Slam championships, and um, in light of that, could you give us a very brief? Um, background of what a poetry slam is. I know there are a lot of people out here who are just now beginning to discover performance poetry and some of them may even be interested in this new poetry slam concept. Yeah, the poetry slam started about um, eight years ago by a guy named Mark Smith in Chicago and uh, it's basically a competition between poets um, where people in the audience um, are given scorecards and they judge each poem. A poet comes up and does a poem. They have a three minute time limit and uh, Mark Smith uh, did this to um, to really bring people back uh, poetry back to people to involve the audience mm -hmm. because he was bemoaning the fact and, and well he should that a lot of the poetry readings have become these very stifling academic uh, podium kind of situations mm -hmm. where there was this hierarchy of the of the the learned poet reading and, and the people in a hushed kind of polite golf clap mm -hmm. maybe at the end of it. Um, he does this in a bar. He started this in a bar in Chicago, Al Capone's old hangout, the Green Mill. Um, actually, he started another place called Get Me High, and then he moved to uh, Al Capone's old hangout. He's a wonderful man, and his heart is really in the right place about this thing because he does the competition really a tongue-in-cheek mm -hmm. kind of thing, um, as it well should be. Um, you should never take anything real serious like that. Um, any of these kind of competitions, whatever these awards are for, I mean, you know, it's anybody's guess who's the Nobel Prize deserved, you know, who deserves <laughs> the Nobel Prize. But, uh, but it, it has done a lot to um, bring people out, I think, because of the concept. And it, we're a culture that thrives on competition. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily like that about our culture. In fact, I don't like it. I think we're, we a little bit too much focus on that. So I'm not Mr. Ra Ra Poetry Slam, but I do think that they've helped popularize poetry again. Um, and, and certainly Mark Smith has done uh, the lion's share of the work to, to bring that out to people. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, I, I, did a, uh, I was in a bookstore in South Florida and uh, they, they, I had the nicely printed, it was a chain bookstore and it, had, it said Poetry Slam. And they didn't really know what they were doing. They didn't know how to do it or anything like mm -hmm. that, but they knew that that was a buzzword <laughs> and so it would bring people in. Mm -hmm. and, and it does, and it, and it does, it certainly does. Um, I'd like to, to see us cooperate more than compete with one another. Mm -hmm. I think there's entirely too much competition in, in, in all facets of American life, and I think it's this hierarchical pyramid scam that we need to kind of level level that off. But again, that's my own Bring the poetry back to the people. Yeah, that's my own background talking to. Ray, we're about out of time. I have so enjoyed this time with you. Um, I know that you said that you love your job, and we certainly love that you have... Um, continue to write and perform for us, and I hope you continue to do that. Oh, yeah. And, uh, Miles to go before I sleep. Thank you for joining us. This has been Writer to Writer, a program for and about writers, sponsored by Florida Community College at Jacksonville. Thank you and goodbye.